నా ప్రియతమ సద్గురు గారిని ఆహ్వానిస్తున్నాము సద్గురు గారు టు ప్లీజ్ కమ్ ఆన్ టు ద స్టేజ్ అండ్ రిక్వెస్టింగ్ ఆర్ అగ్రికల్చర్ మినిస్టర్ నిరంజన్ రెడ్డి గారు టు ఎక్స్చేంజ్ ద మెమరాండమ్ ఆఫ్ అండర్స్టాండింగ్ బిట్వీన్ ద తెలంగాణ గవర్నమెంట్ అండ్ ఈషా హౌస్ హిస్టారిక్ మూమెంట్ సేవ్ సాయిల్ మూమెంట్ ని మొదలు పెట్టి ఎన్నో కంట్రీస్ ట్రావెల్ చేసినటువంటి సభ్యులు ఎంతో మంది రాష్ట్రాల్లో ఉండేటువంటి ముఖ్యమంత్రులు అలాగే ఎంఎల్ఏలు ఎక్స్చేంజ్ చేయడం జరిగింది అండ్ ఈ రోజు మన తెలంగాణలో ఉండేటువంటి వాళ్ళందరికీ గర్వకారణం ఏంటి అంటే తెలంగాణ ప్రభుత్వం కూడా ఎంఓయూని సేవ్ మూమెంట్ తో ఎక్స్చేంజ్ చేయడం నిరంజన్ రెడ్డి గారిని నిరంజన్ రెడ్డి గారిని ఒక్క నిమిషం వేదిక మీద ఉండవలసిందిగా రిక్వెస్ట్ చేస్తూ ఇన్వైటింగ్ ఆన్ స్టేజ్ మినిస్టర్ శ్రీనివాస్ గౌడ్ గారిని వేదిక మీదకి రావాల్సిందిగా రిక్వెస్ట్ చేస్తున్నాము శ్రీనివాస్ గౌడ్ గారు మినిస్టర్ ఫర్ ఫ్రాన్షింగ్ అండ్ ఎక్సైజ్ స్పోర్ట్స్ అండ్ యూత్ సర్వీసెస్ స్టూడెంట్ ప్లీజ్ కమ్ ఆన్ స్టేజ్ ఈ రోజు ఈ కార్యక్రమానికి వచ్చేసినటువంటి శ్రీనివాస్ గౌడ్ గారికి కూడా సాదర స్వాగతం పలుకుతున్నాము to announce in conversation event yes uh, samantha ruth prabhu with sadguru the very versatile actress is the recipient of several awards including four film awards south six south indian international movie awards and two andhra pradesh state nandi awards apart from her acting career she also has started her own ngo pratyusha support to provide medical support for women and children in 2012 Ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you, Samantha Ruth Prabhu, we have a lot of interest in this event. Mana Sam, Eroju, in conversation with uh, Sadhguru. So may I request once again, our dearest Sadhguru to please come on stage. Whether it is a question related to our physical self, spirituality, family or planet, one thing that we all know is, ask Sadhguru. <laughs> our solution to all the problems our dearest sadguru in conversation with samantha don't tell me huh? <laughs> you need to tell the world <laughs> uh, Samantha couldn't come on time because uh, as she was coming somebody informed her I'm wearing an yellow kurta so she had to go back change and come you 
Good evening, Sadhguru. It is absolutely an honor. Her volume up, please. Uh, it's yeah. absolutely an honor to be in your presence. I don't usually carry cue cards, but you know, when you talk, you have the tendency to make people freeze, and I might forget my name, so better safe than sorry. <laughs> Welcome back to Hyderabad. Thank you. The 94th day of your motorbike tour to save soil. 562 events, 26,000 kilometers. I'm just tired saying it. <laughs> Don't you ever get tired, Sadhguru? Uh, see, uh, people continuously asking me almost everywhere, looking at the schedule and the distances we are making. Uh, like what is that, 500, 500, 562, 562, 562 events? 562 events <laughs> means on an average eight to nine events per day is what's been happening along the way apart from the riding. So, uh, <clears throat> so continuously almost in every nation this is a question, how do you manage this? I must tell you, I was uh, riding towards Bucharest and uh, I was to reach there at seven o'clock and seven o'clock there was a television interview. But uh, weather got very bad and the roads, road can... What is that? Can't hear? What? Uh, you're blocking their view, I... You can see there. Oh, that's okay, please. Now they can't change that, please. Hmm? You look at the screen. Uh, you always seen Samantha only on the screen, so what does it matter? <laughs> it's not me they're here for, Sadhguru. Huh? It's not me they're here for. <laughs> So, uh, so I was to go there at seven o'clock in the evening, but uh, the, the ride became nine and a half hours instead of six hours as it was planned. So I reached there around 11.15 and uh, they were still waiting, the television crew. So I walked straight into the event and uh, well an hour and a half when we finished it was nearly one o'clock in the morning and then I was talking to them. So this anchor said, at this age, how do you ride for nine hours and come and do an interview and you're still fine? He repeated the word this age three times and I didn't like it <laughs> I, I'm warning you so that you don't use that <laughs> I'll make note <laughs> So I told him, I told him, see I lived my life so intensely, I never had the time to get old. You need… you need lot of time to get old, where is the time to get old? <laughs> Can you please give me the secret as well? I will. I would like to stay this way for some time <laughs> <laughs> We will… we will reveal the secrets <laughs> <laughs> So I see your amazing bike and some would say a bike tour an unusual way to create awareness. Why a bike tour, Sadhguru? Why a motorcycle? Well, see, uh, the thing is, um, last two and a half years particularly, I've been talking to various agricultural ministries, scientists, top scientists in the world, soil scientists I mean, and bureaucrats and variety of people who hold responsible positions in the world. And I discovered that everybody knows the problem, everybody generally knows the direction of the solution, then wondering, why is it not happening? Everybody knows the problem, everybody knows the solution. Then I realized they are waiting for an idiot to build a cat, so here I am. So if I fly around and do it, it won't have that. So I have to walk, if I walk I might die, most probably yes. Or if I cycle, definitely it'll kill me. So motorcycle could kill, there were many dangerous moments. Uh, it could, when you're going at this pace, when I say this pace, 
like every day, you know, we are well above the speed limits and trying to get to the place because events and events are happening on the way, they're stopping us on the roads and there are events. So, I don't hold... Uh, I'm not a minister, I'm not... I don't hold any position of power in the world, I don't have any, uh, you know, anything to command because I don't have an army. All I have is I have people's love and goodwill, so... I thought, uh, so that is the only asset I have, so that's the only thing I can play with. I've been talking about this for thirty years and whenever I speak about it, people say this is great, this is fantastic and then they will sleep on it. So, now we wanted to awaken something, I knew the simple way for me to do it is uh, to put myself to some risk and it's worked because three days ago our social media metrics without... Uh, without WhatsApp is reading at 2.8 billion people have spoken about soil. But when I started... when I started in London, a lady journalist was interviewing me and uh, she said, Sadhguru, come on, why have you become like this? Can't you pick up something else? Soil is the most unromantic thing, who will support you? Who is going to talk about soil? D just don't do this, do something else. Talk about the sky, maybe heaven <laughs> Not soil, who is going to be interested in this? Look at this. <laughs> there is this constant question about river water being wasted to the ocean, Sadhguru. So, is there a way that we can save it? See, the river water must go to the ocean. On the way you can drink, you can irrigate your lands a little bit, you can use it, but river water must go to the ocean. This is a very wrong concept which lot of states are unfortunately taking. If the river water does not go, enough river water, I would say in ideal conditions minimum fifty percent should go. But with our population pressure, where we have four percent of the world's land, and seventeen point six percent of population, world's population, with this pressure, you cannot expect fifty percent to flow. At least twenty-five percent of the river water must flow into the ocean. Why? India has seven thousand six hundred square kilometers of coastline. So along this coastline, there's an ecosystem which is semi-marine, marine kind of ecosystem. It's a completely different ecosystem than the marine ecosystem and also different from the river water itself because it's a meeting of these two, meeting and mingling of these two different types of waters. If this buffer goes away, then marine ingress will happen. The marine water will start percolating into the soil and coming in. You, you know from Tamil Nadu, eighty kilometers inside, marine water has come right now in Chuttikorin region. Just fifteen years ago, it was all sweet water. Today all the wells are salt water. People have vacated the whole villages. You will see ghost villages, completely empty villages, all locked homes and they've left because there is no sweet water anywhere. Up to hundred kilometers it can come. If all the rivers, if you use it up inside for human... Uh, whatever you want to call it, human reproduction, I would say. <laughs> if you use it up like this, then up to hundred kilometers marine ingress can happen. Seven thousand six hundred kilometers coastline, hundred kilometers means you would have lost one third of the nation. This is about the same size of land that you partitioned with Pakistan and Bangladesh at one time in 1948. That's how much land you will lose once again if rivers don't flow into the ocean. Sadhguru, since I have this time with you, I'm going to be greedy and ask a few questions that have been on my mind for a while. Personally, I love to visit places of worship. I believe in a higher power, in good energy, in karma. But there is a counter viewpoint that religion divides us. 
what is the purpose of religion in our lives today and how would you answer an atheist who says that the world would be a better place without the divisive policies of religion? I very much agree with that <laughs> because… because of the way we are propagating it today. See, most religions that you know today, in its infancy started as spiritual processes, as a quest for human being to know something beyond just eating, reproducing, sleeping, beyond that, because there's a longing. It's not taught to you, there's a natural longing within you. See, if you're struggling for food, food will be the only thing. If you're struggling to have a shelter, that'll be the only thing. Suppose everything you want is just provided today, then suddenly you wonder, why am I here? What is it? So there is a longing to know. A human being cannot simply say, I don't want to know anything, I will just eat well and live well. It doesn't work because your intelligence has evolved into a certain place where without asking a question you cannot exist. So when I say without asking a question, question means a quest. Question is just a tool to dig deeper into something, whatever you wish to know. But right now, all religions started with this question, but today most religions have come to this place, you cannot ask a question, if you ask a question, you're dead. So, with what purpose it started and what it has become today is a different thing. So, we need to make a distinction between religion, religious process and spiritual process. It has become necessary today to do this because today religion means belief. You believe this, this and this, then you belong to this religion. If you believe that, 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 you become that religion. So when you say, I believe something, it's like this. How many of you here believe you have two hands, all of you just raise one hand? If you have… if you believe you have two hands, do you believe you have two hands or you know that you have two hands? You know. If somebody starts an argument with you to prove that you have no hands, if their argument becomes too overwhelming, one slap in the face, <laughs> he knows you got hands. This happens in the movies, huh? <laughs> But in God you believe. Why? Because you're still not even straight enough to admit what you do not know as I do not know. This much sincerity should enter human heart and intelligence. What I know, I know. What I do not know, I do not know. What is the problem? Whatever I do not know, I believe. You're destroying I do not know. I do not know is the most tremendous possibility in your life. When you see I do not know, the longing to know, the seeking to know and the possibility of knowing becomes a reality. If you destroy I do not know, you will just believe something because it's come from some authority or people claim it's come from an authority or in other words, in your life, authority becomes the truth. Spiritual process means truth is the only authority for you. Another question um, that has been on my mind lately is how much of one's life is a result of their past karma? Are the injustices and unfairnesses that one faces in one's life a result of their past karma? If so, do you accept these injustices on, and find solace in the fact that, okay, the karma is being cleared <laughs> 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 even though it might seem detrimental to our lives in so many ways? Uh, Samantha, you're old enough for this. I'm not saying you're old, I said you're old enough <laughs> Uh, that, do you still expect the world to be fair to you? That's why I'm asking this question <laughs> <laughs> that, that Can I blame it on my past karma is what that, I'm asking. Uh, were you, I want the world to be fair to me is a schoolgirl question. 
By now you should know the world is not fair, it will not be fair to you. But if you dig deep into yourself and have a taste of life, not a taste of your thought and emotion, the taste of life that you are, then you will see life is not just fair, it's just fantastic. So, do you want fair life or fantastic life? You must decide <laughs> Um, I've noticed this, that beyond the material ego, there is now suddenly a wide spre Who's spread... Who's this ego guy, your friend? <laughs> is all around me <laughs> and in my industry, the heights of it. <laughs> so beyond the material ego, I've noticed there's, com there's now widespread spiritual ego. I've come across a lot of people who are now on a spiritual path, <laughs> not you Sadhguru, <laughs> who, who, who consider themselves superior to people who are not on a spiritual path. How would you advise such people to ensure that they don't fall a prey to this new spiritual ego? <laughs> we'll… Uh, first we'll address this ego guy, okay? If you show me where it is, I'll fix it right now. I wish I knew where it was, it just keeps coming suddenly. No, you don't know where it is. The thing is just this, say at certain moments, as a person, as a woman, you are a beautiful person, wonderful person, I mean. I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't say only at certain times you're beautiful, you're always beautiful, but certain times you're wonderful, <laughs> all right? Certain moments maybe you're nasty, possible. So whenever you're nasty, you say, it's my ego. Why don't you say, it's me, I'm sometimes wonderful, sometimes nasty. If you see this, naturally nastiness will go down. But if you say, whenever you're nasty, Mr. Ego does this, and you don't know where he is, you don't know his address or ID, nor do you know his phone number, <laughs> so how do you fix this guy? So everybody has this going in their life, because uh, this is uh, spiritual jargon without being spiritual, is all over the place, particularly in India. Because we have, uh, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand years of spiritual history, so we know all the words. We know what Atma, Paramatma, this one, that one, Ankara, everything we know, words only <laughs> Words only, <laughs> noted <laughs> So we can just throw words like this and confuse the Western population quite a bit. <laughs> because if you come here, they'll say Mukti, Shakti, this one, that one, all kinds of things, they'll just… <laughs> they'll think I know a lot of people who've gone and set up spiritual centers in the West, particularly in America, because they just know one chant, just one chant. <laughs> okay, Asatoma, Sadgamaya, with this they run the whole thing <laughs> So, <laughs> so unfortunately, spirituality, uh, in some ex… in some ways it's come there. It's come there because there is need in the society, there is not enough source. Because of that, people are manufacturing this here and there. I must tell you this, is it okay if I take a few minutes? <laughs> this happened, uh, you know, uh, a few years ago, fifteen, twelve, fifteen, sixteen years ago. And uh, I was in the United States and then uh, Somebody in the office, our office told me, Sadhguru, did you know every day, hundred thousand people are typing out the word spiritual? I said, is that so? Type it out and see what comes out. Are we even there in the picture? <laughs> they typed out spirituality. First thing that comes up is a spa in Mexico. You've been there. <laughs> <laughs> and the next thing that comes out is a call girl in Northern California. She has learned uh, all that SEO. 
for everything she says spiritual, 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 108 times she uses the wor word spiritual on our website. You say spiritual, she comes up, number two. I thought this is a shame. For thousands of years, anything spiritual means people looked east. East means India, that's what it meant. So I said we must start something, uh, a spiritual gateway that if people say, if they seek spirituality, they must look towards India. Because this is one culture which has spent maximum amount of time <laughs> maximum amount of time exploring human consciousness and the mechanics of what a human being is, how this functions on the surface and its very core. How does this function? What can we do about it? This has been explored. I am not saying this out of my Indian origin. I am saying this after looking at the world closely, that nowhere else has it been looked at like this. So, I said uh, we must start a spiritual gateway, India, the spiritual gateway. As a part of this, uh, I thought, till then I must tell you this, Till about fifteen years ago, I had not met a single guru in this country. I, I just did not meet, I was just busy doing my own work. I never thought I had to go and look for somebody, I had never been to any other ashram anywhere. And uh, then I thought, okay, let me make an attempt, then I started making phone calls. Uh, they all received my call pretty well and then I started visiting some people and started putting together. We had one meeting with one hundred and twenty-five gurus. We made this uh, thing that nobody talks about their philosophy. You keep your philosophy, this is just a meeting. This is just about how to enhance your ashram or your yoga center, whatever you have, how to enhance the quality. We will teach you management, we will teach you branding, we will teach you how to make a website, we will teach you how to present yourself to in the international community. Your philosophy, we don't, we don't touch, you don't touch mine, I don't touch yours, you do your own thing. Because that is the beauty of this culture, that it can exist in hundreds of forms, thousands of forms, and it's okay with us. So when I went about doing this, well, I met many wonderful people, but at the same time, at least sixty to sixty-five percent, I… it hurts me to say this, I found that if I walk into an airport or a golf course, I meet better men than in the so-called spiritual centers because it's full of jargon, no heart, no depth, no profoundness, simply one-one chant, one-one nonsense, one philosophy that they read somewhere, it's going on like this, this needs to change. So to bring this profoundness to people, as people get closer to me, I get harder and harder and harder. Those who are very close to me, I am bloody cruel. <laughs> yes, because just to bring integrity into spirituality is so hard. Because the moment they get spiritual, little, like you said, you're calling it spiritual ego, I call it spiritual airs. They get spiritual airs, air bubbles get in their head. Suddenly they start acting funny, they start seeing things that don't exist, they start talking about nonsense that nobody understands. If you speak something, whatever nonsense you speak, people in front of you must understand, otherwise why the hell are you speaking? Because the purpose of speech is to make somebody understand what you're saying. No, if I say something that you don't understand, I become big, you become small. This is rubbish. This is going on for too long. So everybody quotes a book, every… it all looks like, you know, we're right now talking about earth buddies. We are creating an earthworm image, we are trying to create an NFT. We've, over forty thousand images we have created, we will release it shortly. We'll give, gift you one earth, earthworm, okay? Now, these are all bookworms who fell out of a book. These bookworms were important when people… there was low literacy in the societies. Only one man in the village could read the book, suddenly he was very valuable. Now everybody can read, what is the point you reading a book to me? If you have something to say other than the book, you tell me. If you're going to read a book, what is the point? When I was in graduation, when I was in the university, I made an agreement with the teachers, I will not come and bother you with my questions. Just give me attendance, I will stay out. Because 
if you go there, from the first moment you go there, first attendance, that's the only interesting thing. <coughs> And after that, they're just reading some notes and everybody is writing down. Those days fout fountain pens, kara 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 kara, it makes noise. I don't like it. I say, see, if everything is in that book, give it to us, we'll photocopy it and give it back to you. You… I don't have to come, you don't have to come. <laughs> I have… I have many interesting things to do in the town. I don't know about you, but I have many interesting things to do in the town. I don't have to sit here and write down, I can photocopy this. So they didn't want me, so I said, give me attendance. Only once a month I went there to check my attendance, whether they were keeping the deal. I sat in the garden outside, <laughs> okay? Why I am saying this is, when you are also literate, why should somebody read the damn book to you? You read? If they have something to say which no, big, no book can say, of course, then you must listen. So, this whole spirituality as a thing, unfortunately has fallen on bad times, but slowly it is rising because people's longing is increasing. I must tell you this, forty years ago when I first started the programs, in our engineering programs, in various different forms, eighty-five percent of the people used to come to the programs only for health problems. Only twelve, fifteen percent came to know something. Today, over ninety percent of the people come because they want to know something, experience something. Only eight to ten percent. <laughs> Only eight to ten percent are coming for health issues, which is a significant change in human consciousness. About this ego business, this is one thing we must settle. See, within you, is there only one person or two? I think one. <laughs> you think one? Mm -mm, I'm going to go with one. One. <laughs> that means you're an individual. An individual means, the word individual comes from indivisible. You're not further divisible, that's good. You're an indiv individual. If you are two, then you are either schizophrenic or possessed. Psychiatrist or <laughs> exorcist <laughs> Either a psychiatrist or an exorcist has to come. So this is very important, everybody settle this, that don't talk about atma, paramatma, ego, this one, that one. You are an individual. What kind are you? Are you a wonderful one or a nasty one? Fix the damn thing. So you're saying, Sadhguru, don't give excuses that, you know, this is me and this is my ego and we are two different. No. <laughs> you are one and take responsibility yes. for it. Okay. If you do that, definitely you will eliminate the nastiness to whatever extent possible. Thank you, Sadhguru. My last question is, um, there is a criticism that new age spirituality is for the wealthy and privileged. How would you advise an underprivileged householder who has neither the money nor the time to embark on a spiritual journey, although they are seeking for it. Why is he holding on to a house? You said householder there. Yes. yes. Why are they holding on to a house? You should live in a house, you should not hold on to it. Right now that's their problem. They are holding on to a house. <laughs> their whole life is around what they own, what they possess. Obviously, they can't leave the damn place and go anywhere. So, the moment your possessions decide the quality of who you are, then you yourself become a material. There's a question there. Ask. I'm sorry, I didn't get the last… No, I'm saying, the moment your possessions decide the quality of who you are, then you will also become a material part. You will not be a human anymore. You will not be a consciousness anymore. Material is there, things are there, clothes are there, home is there, thing… you know, this, all this is there. Why? Because if you do not arrange this convenience, every day you will be only struggling for that. You won't do anything worthwhile in your life. Because every day if you have to earn your food, can you think of anything higher, I'm asking? 
whole… whole attention will be just on that. The idea of making arrangements for ourselves as it's convenient for us is so that our intelligence, our creativity, our possibilities find expression in life. Every day if you have to worry about where is my food today, then you can't do anything worthwhile. So do not misunderstand possessions as a way of enhancing your life. It is a way of making your life convenient so that you can focus on what you want to do. If you have to earn your dinner from now to dinner time, uh, what, what can you do? What worthwhile things can you do? You will only have to go, go foraging for food, isn't it? So, arrangements are there in everybody's life. How much arrangement is needed? As much as is needed for your kind of life, so that arrangements never become an impediment. For most people it's an impediment because if somebody is a householder, he'll be holding the house and sitting right there. That's what most people are doing. That is what most people are doing. I'm talking about eighty, ninety-year-olds. They say, I want to come to the ashram, Sadhguru, but... <laughs> what is but? <laughs> but is nobody to take care of the house. <laughs> Leave the goddamn house and come, you're eighty-five years of age. <laughs> you're holding the house so much that you think it's going to go with you. There's no container service, definitely nobody transports homes. <laughs> so, these householders, they must change their thing, they must live in the house. What kind of house? Whatever is convenient for them. When I say convenience, somebody wants to build a house for ten crores. They are… they're capable of making their money and building that house. If they can do it effortlessly, let them do it. For somebody else, ten lakh rupee house itself is a burden. You know, there used to be movies maybe before you came, uh, at least in Canada, I know, there are movies about, oh, build a house and see, get somebody, your daughter married and see, these are the most difficult things to do in life. Are, daughter will get married, leave her alone, eh? <laughs> if you just leave her alone, she'll get married without any expense. And uh, building a house, what if it is such a burden, why the hell are you building a house, you know? <laughs> I was in uh, United States and uh, they were asking me, Sadhguru, is it true next time when Jesus comes, he will come in, uh, what is that, Salt Lake City <laughs> You know Salt Lake City, you don't know? Oh, there is a whole story, I won't go into it <laughs> uh, I said, see, last time he came around Jerusalem and he came and he said, come follow me, only twelve guys. Out of the whole population, only twelve guys he got. Out of that, one of them freaked on him anyway <laughs> But if he comes to United States, now in twenty-first century, and says, come follow me. Nobody will be behind him because you got thirty-five year house mortgage, fifteen year card mortgage, twenty year student loan <laughs> Where will you go? At that time, somebody said, you master, my father is dead, can I bury him and come? That man says, leave the dead to the dead. And you, if he says, leave the bank to the bank, bank will come and catch you anyway <laughs> Once you have mortgage, thirty-five years, thirty-five year mortgage, what is your lifespan? Ten thousand years, is it? I mean, what kind of life is this? In thirty-five years, if something spectacular happened here, you can't change the direction of your life, what kind of life are you building for yourself? Hello? Life, life should be light and agile. You're going this way because this is all you know right now. If something really spectacular shines here, you must be able to go there. Otherwise, what kind of life is this?
So only then, only when you have that free freedom, spiritual process will thrive in a given society. So right now when you say, well, instead of householders, let me go to those people who are living in huts, who are struggling for daily food. It will be obscene for me to go to that man or woman who is struggling for daily bread, to go and tell, come, let's meditate. I will never do such an obscene act. I will talk about how to get better bread, how to get it, what to do. Because when a person, when a human being is hungry, you talking to him of mukti is the worst possible thing you can do. So, this is important that we understand. This is important that we understand that if finer aspects of life has to come alive in a society, basic survival should be taken care of for everybody. Only then it's possible. When large number of people are struggling for survival, finer things won't come. Forget about spirituality, even art, music, fine things won't happen, isn't it? Where is the time to appreciate art? Where is the time to look at finer things? Where is the time to look at a sunrise or a sunset when you're struggling for your food on a daily basis? So it's extremely important. Basic economic well-being has to happen if spirituality has to thrive. And the reason, the reason why... Hey, you can save that for the end, okay? I'll give you ten minutes to go on clapping, okay? The reason why spiritual process thrived the way it thrived in this land is because we had a spell, a golden sp uh, period of eight to ten thousand years of well-being. That is when spirituality thrived because everybody ate well, after that what? Because if you had come here as any other creature on this planet, stomach full, life settled. But once you come as a human being, Stomach empty, only one problem. Stomach full, one hundred problems. You got one hundred? Hey, ninety-nine now <laughs> So, uh, this is the nature of a human being that only after survival is taken care of, what it means to be human becomes relevant to you. When your survival is in question, you're just another creature, like every other creature. Only when survival is taken care of, what are the other aspects of being human beyond eating, sleeping, reproduction and dying one day, what else can I do with myself? This comes up only when there is some assurance of survival. This is why I am constantly in economic forums and economic conferences because economically if there is no well-being in a society, who the hell will meditate? Thank you, Sadhguru, for your time. Thank you so much. You, you Do don't? we have que questions? So I'm uh, making an offer to you, Samantha. If you, uh, if you, if you get me twenty-five million people as Earth buddies, I'll give you a ride on the motorcycle. How's that? Is? I mean, <laughs> I think I can. I, I, I can. Yeah, I can. I can. I can. Okay, then it's a promise. I'll huh? beg if I have to. <laughs> so, <laughs> it can touch 275. It's it, sorry? It is capped at 275. But if you want, I can remove the cap and make it more. <laughs> Zoom in. <laughs> I, I think we. Do we have time for a few questions from the audience? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, okay, great. Namaskar. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Where are you? I'm here, Sadhguru. Where? I'm here, Sadhguru. Yeah, you must say, I am ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. Yep. Uh, uh, glad to be here, blessed to be here. The question is, why our older generation used to say, whenever you are going to a great guru or someone, don't touch their feet, touch the soil. Don't? Touch their feet, touch the soil and then you come up. Why you used to say that? I had this question. I, I did not get that question. Please, if you can repeat. So, uh, 
elderly people used to say that whenever you visit a great guru, don't directly touch their uh, feet, but definitely touch just the soil before that. They used to say that. So, any reason for that, whether it is related to any safe soil movement or spirituality movement? Oh, I agree with these elderly people because when I'm riding, wherever, uh, you know, there are safe soil uh, lineups, a few are formally organized, others by themselves, a few hundred people gathering all over in every state that we are going. When I'm riding, if I ride away fast, they'll feel bad, I don't want to do that. So I slow down. The people who did not get this advice, these guys when I'm riding, they're coming and grabbing my leg. <laughs> the motorcycle weighs 360 kilograms and they're pulling off my leg like this. They didn't hear this advice. I wish they had spoken more loudly. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so the, the thing is, see, to touch a human being, even if it's a child, they must be willing, isn't it? When they're willing, Maybe you can hold their hand, maybe you can hug them, maybe you can touch their feet. Depending on what type of relationship accordingly, people can do different things between human beings. Otherwise, in this culture we told you this. Now, lot of people have become half English in this country. They don't know why hands are shaken. Even in India, everybody is grabbing everybody's hands and doing like this with both the hands. <laughs> you need to understand this handshaking came because of the cold in England. It's so cold, when you hold hands, <laughs> you don't do that in forty degree centigrade And on top of it, many of them are wearing jackets in forty degrees centigrade. I was… I was at a corporate uh, meeting, uh, you know, a few years ago in Mumbai. It was a board meeting, they invited me because they wanted some advice on something. And uh, everybody was in their jackets and ties. Outside temperature was around thirty-six, thirty-seven. I said, see, if I had put my money in your company and I saw you guys wearing jackets and ties in thirty-seven degrees, I would take away my money immediately because you guys don't know what you're doing, <laughs> isn't it? You're supposed to manage everybody's money. You must feel the weather, hello? You must always be sensing for every… every sign that is there around you, economic signs maybe, business signs, but if you don't even notice the weather, you wear jacketed, no Sadhguru, it is a requirement. Who made the requirement? Who told you it's a requirement? No, no, it's a… you know, it is expected. I said, who the hell is expecting, huh? Why are you wearing a tie in India when the temperatures are the way they are? All this is done to prevent cold affecting your throat. You. <laughs> <laughs> In summer, you're wearing ties and walking around. Uh, this is slavery at the core of <laughs> Indian mind. This needs to go. I was <laughs> I was in our tribal school. The government is running a small one-room school in the tribal village. We were educating the children in the ashram, but the government opened a small school, one one-room school, one teacher who comes once in a way. And uh, I go there and uh, all these uh, girl children, they're wearing ties like necklaces here. They think they have, it's a kind of a necklace they were <laughs> wearing it here. I said, what is this? <laughs> Why is the state government insisting these girls should wear a tie to the school? Where the hell are we? So I'm saying it is time we rejig this nation in so many ways. It's good to touch the soil where the guru has stepped rather than grabbing his feet. So, don't molest the guru's feet without his permission.
It's molestation, hello <laughs>
But on this planet, this is the most complex life. The most complex life means, in terms of evolution, you are the flower of evolution. Compared to all the other creatures, this is the flower of evolutionary process. A flower that bloomed after millions of years of, I will say, R&D work. Research and development happened from an amoeba to who you are now. How much work? How many capabilities? How many sensitivities? How much competence? If you were an amoeba, what you could do? And today what you can do, is it even comparable? It's another world altogether. So for this much to happen, so much work has happened. Now once this complexity comes, complexity can tie itself in knots to keep it open, to make it into something that will easily go in the breeze. If this was little damp, it wouldn't go. If it is little knotted, it wouldn't go. It has to, if the breeze comes, it must fly. But that is not happening to many lives because they've knotted themselves up. Why do they knot themselves? See, I don't know how old you are, by the time you don't go till eighteen these days, by the time you're sixteen, seventeen, you're looking for a bond. When bond ages, it becomes a bond age. When… why are you looking for bondages? Because you're afraid of freedom. Freedom is a terrible thing. Anything can happen to you. Hello? Freedom is a terrible thing because anything can happen to you. People come to me and say, Sadhguru, please bless us, nothing should happen to me. Say, hey, what kind of blessing is this? Let everything happen to you, huh? <laughs> Let everything that can happen in life happen to you. What is it? Nothing should happen to you means you must be dead. Why are you even alive? So essentially, this is a hangover from the past. Right now, human being is in that state. Like if you kept a bird in a cage for many years and one day you took away the door, but the bird just sits there because food comes there, it's safe, it need not do all this nonsense. Lot of work, hello? Flying is a lot of work, isn't it? Simply you can sit there and do kiki ki pee 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 and eat. <laughs> That's what most human beings are choosing to do. What is safe? Householders holding on to the house because it's safe. I'm not against your house. You need a house as a human being, you can't sleep under a tree. You need a house, but you should live in the house, not holding it. In your mind, if you're holding on to it, Ah, then you are a caged bird. As I told you, I know people who are eighty, ninety years of age, they can't come for three days, they want to come desperately. Sadhguru, I want to come and be in your presence. They come, what is the problem? But my house… <laughs> you are not a householder, house is holding you. <laughs> so, like this you hold on to many things because you don't know you are in the middle of nowhere, I want you to grasp this. Right now you are in the stadium, it's okay. Actually, if you look at it, you are on a tiny little mud ball that you call as planet Earth. You don't know where the hell it is floating in this cosmos, where it is going, whether it's going or not, whether it will be there the next moment or not, you don't know. Do you know? Hello? Does anybody know I'm asking? No. Does any scientist know? Does somebody else know? Nobody knows. But here we are sitting and fine, out of ignorance, not out of knowledge. Simply we think we are fine, we are forever. Don't worry, everything will be okay, don't worry, be happy, all kinds of stuff. No, the beauty of life is to know all the possibilities and still not to be perturbed or disturbed by that. Not knowing anything and you're okay, that's okay for a child. If you stay that way, we call you a retard.
Yes, I know it's a harsh word to use, but that is the case. Because keeping yourself ignorant and thinking you're innocent is a retarded way of existence, isn't it? Hello? Am I saying harsh things to you? I'm like this, I'm horrible only, what to do? Because I am not here to say sweet things and put you to sleep. I am here to awaken people. <laughs> See, even for you to say, save soil, I had to ride twenty-six thousand kilometers. I could have told you from the yoga center, please save soil, you should have all… Yes, yes Sadhguru. No, thirty years I've spoken, nothing. Now coming away, I'm glad you have. So. It's not just about that, the important thing is you're always trying to hold on to something. If you sit on this chair for three days, <laughs> this is chair holder <laughs> Anything, anything that you touch sticks to you. If I want you to imagine yourself, because right now it's happening mentally, Let's say it happened physically, oh, this is my vessel, it got stuck to you. This is my chair, it got stuck to you. This is my person, got stuck to you. That is my brother, my sister, my wife, my husband, everybody got stuck to you. What a heap of mess you will be. Physically imagine what all is stuck to you in your mind. If it was all stuck to you physically, how terrible a life it would be. And that's what is happening. Because of that, Nothing penetrates, everything you are like a stone wall. So if you have to become like breeze, that everything should flow through you, you should be available to life all the time, there is some work to do. If you simply fall in love with everything, it will happen. But that is a little confusing because your idea of love is again to possess somebody. Hello? Yes, isn't it? See, love means they must belong to you. No, 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 that's not how it is. Love means what you love you must liberate, isn't it? Hello? No? So if you… if you love the life that is here, because that's all that's here, you must liberate it. This is why mukti is not a concept that somebody made up. This is the innermost longing, but that longing is in many ways suppressed on a daily basis, talking about safety, talking about security, talking about sanity, talking about doing the right thing in the society, your duty, your nonsense, you suppress the mukti or the longing for mukti, which is not a teaching or a philosophy, it is the deepest longing. If I keep you imprisoned in a five by five cubicle, you will want to become free desperately, isn't it? If I release you into a ten by ten cubicle, you'll feel wonderful for two days. Then you'll feel this is a terrible prison. If I release you into a hundred by hundred cubicle, you'll feel this is fantastic for a week. And then you'll feel terribly imprisoned. It doesn't matter where I set the boundary. The moment you realize there is a boundary to my life, there is something within you longing to break that boundary. This is the longing for mukti. It is not a concept, it is not a philosophy. This is the life's inner, most innate longing is to become free. But freedom is a terrible thing because anything could happen to you. So you bind yourself. Even if you bind yourself, it still happens to you. <laughs> Life is not going to spare you, it still happens to you. It's like somebody asked me, you know, Sadhguru, some, uh, some of my friends say they function really well. When they drink alcohol, when they smoke marijuana, they become very creative, they become uh, very effective. Yeah, that guy also <laughs> All this. So I said, see, nobody becomes better. Nobody functions better by lowering their faculties. It is just that they become less ashamed of doing things clumsy <laughs> 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 
Alcohol takes away shame. <laughs> Anybody, please take the microphone, whoever. Namaskaram. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Boo, boo, boo. Oh. Here, here. 115. One o'clock. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Okay. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. As we all know that early centuries, um, our India is in uh, Vishwaguru position. So you are roaming all the all around the world. So I would like to know uh, what is the position of our country in the world. What, what, what is that? Oh, 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 wait, wait. What is that Vishwaguru position? Who the hell is listening to you? <laughs> Who the hell has been listening to you to call yourself a guru in the world? Okay. Hello? You think the world is listening to India? Yeah, hmm? before that, uh, so oh. many, we have listened about it, that Vishwaguru is our India. So, I would like to know what is the position of our country in the world. Okay. So, uh, uh, we must... Uh, yes, in the past, people have respected this nation for the wisdom and knowledge that this land exuded, as I said earlier, that is mainly because we were protected by two geographical features of the day. One is the Himalayas, another is the Indian Ocean. It is because of this we called ourselves Hindus, Himalaya and Hindusagara. Between that, the land that lies is Hindu land or Hindustan, because we got protected by this. Everywhere else, across Europe, Central Asia, warlords were fighting constantly, you know, raping, looting, burning each other's habitations. But we were in a peaceful place because they couldn't cross Himalayas, nor did they have the means to cross the Indian Ocean and get here. Once they managed to cross Himalayas, after that you know what happened in the last thousand years, <laughs> all right? So, because of that kind of protected geography, we invested in science, mathematics, music, spiritual process in a, in a very uh, big way. But at the same time, we did not produce fighting men, for that we paid the price. Now we have realized that and doing whatever we are doing, it's fine. So, yes it is true at one time anything spiritual, anything profound, means look towards India was a natural process. But uh, I don't think we have that right now. We must gain it once again because we still have the possibility, we still have the fundamentals for that. We have the fundamentals but we have to build on it. But uh, there is a problem of, as I said, all sorts of people going and setting up spiritual centers in the West, and doing some silly things and getting ridiculous amount of bad press out there and... You know, what I have seen is, now it is different wherever I go, every door is open in the world. But in the last thirty years, every door was closed. A university, a conference, a important events in the world, everything was closed for an Indian guru because People who went ahead of me had made sure that everything is sealed. <laughs> really, you had to really work hard and prove your worth, otherwise nobody would open a door for you. Today, everybody wants us, that's different, but unfortunately this has happened. A guru is a four-letter word, it's a bad word. What, you're a guru? They say, oh, you see, oh Sadhguru, you don't look like a guru. You… you don't talk like a guru. How is a guru supposed to talk? Oh, they're supposed to say some inane stupid things that nobody understands. <laughs> yes, really openly some top influencers in United States telling me this. A guru is supposed to say some inane miserable things that nobody understands and nobody cares. Only in his community, people who don't know how to read that book, he and he reads the book, they're listening to him. So unfortunately this has happened, but in many ways we are once again putting India back on the spiritual map of the world in a big way. 
the <laughs> the reach the reach across africa south america north america europe central asia central asia is like almost 100% i must tell you this incident i was in uh, cote d'ivoire or it's called as ivory coast i was in abidjan which is the capital i was there for the cop 15 uh, my saudi Saudi Arabian visa was not cleared. So uh, because I had time there, I went to the agency which was issuing this visa. But they wanted my fingerprints, so I had to go there. So this was in some inside locality, not a proper embassy. So I went there and I was coming out, somebody else was driving the car. I was sitting in the front seat. Uh, it was around 11.30, 12 in the morning, I mean noon time. One guy was sitting there on the street side, on the floor. This is the kind of guy who is drunk by eleven o'clock in the morning. Or like that whistling boy, <laughs> he's, a, he's a, either smoked up or s s uh, drunk, that kind of guy. Sitting there on the floor, on the street, on the sidewalk. He looks at me and says, seriously, Sadhguru? <laughs> I thought, this is it <laughs> <laughs> so, we are once again touching the world, we won't disappoint you. <laughs> I want you to know the Save Soil movement is under the banner of Conscious Planet because without conscious human beings, you can't save nothing, nothing. So. It is about creating conscious planet means individual human beings have to become conscious. There is no such thing as making the planet conscious. You and me have to become conscious, that's the whole thing. So this work is going on in 2020, I don't know what is the numbers for 2021, it's definitely higher. In 2020, our video views touched 2.4 billion. And uh, I am not a beautiful superstar like you, <laughs> just like that, talking little sense. Because there is that much thirst in the world, there is that much longing in human beings wanting to know something. When that longing is there, we should not disappoint them. And above all, this is the first time in the history of humanity that we can sit here and talk to the entire world. Many great beings have come, when they spoke hardly ten people could hear them. This is the first time we can sit here and talk to the entire world. When we have tools and technologies and possibilities like this, if we do not transform the world, it shows that we don't care enough. Namaskaram. <laughs> Can ask her also. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I think it's for both of you, sir. Okay. Ma so, what at an individual level can I contribute to make a difference and to make to save soil? Like, what is the basic contribution can I make as an individual? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not like a great person like you are, ma'am. So, like a common man, what can I do? A small thing to save soil. Say, uh, please. One thing is, uh, you being a common man is a lie. First thing, you're not a man. Another thing is, you're not common. I don't see anybody else like you, so you're not common. I know in your life, within yourself, you're very special for your own life, isn't it? Hello? Let's be straight about this. Within your own home, you are a very special person. If somebody treats you in a common way, will you take it? No. So don't use those things that those things are said in political rallies, it's okay. There is no common man in the world. If you meet him in a private space, he's a very special guy. So don't describe yourself like that. You're doing this, I'm sorry I'm being little like this, uh, because I'm using this question to prick everybody, not just you. 
you're doing this as to how I can do less. Because everybody says, Sadhguru, but I am only human. Are? Being a human means being on top of the world. Of all the creatures on this planet, you are right on the top, yes or no? In the evolutionary scale of things, you are on top of the world and you say, I am only human. When will you say, I am human? Because human is a great possibility, but you always refer to your humanity as a weakness. You always refer to your humanity as if it can't do anything. So now, you have a phone with you? Phone, phone. Is it a smart one or a dumb one? <laughs> huh? Smart one, see? Then what's the problem? You have a smart companion with you, always at your beck and call. So when you have such a smart companion, that guy, you call him, you given him a name? No, because these days people are giving names to their phones. Where is my pinky? Where is my pinky? <laughs> Somebody was looking for their pinky and I said, what pinky? No, my phone, I call it pinky, it's on it is written pinky. So no name for the guy. We'll call him Ramo today. <laughs> Am I being too nasty? Is it okay? I call my car Huh? I call my car Trocker. <laughs> <laughs> she confessed something, I'm not telling her. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you have a powerhouse in your hands. This is a powerhouse. Just you, just you, one person, leave the others, just you, if you are really committed with this kind of a companion in your hand, you can touch the four billion people I'm talking about. You can. Will you or will you not, that's left to you.